Good morning, once again. <clears throat> it is uh, good to be here. Well, as you can see up on the slide there, there's a, a drawing. And just so you know, that was not my personal drawing. Uh, but years ago, uh, I received this picture. I, I want to say Caleb was probably in kindergarten or first grade when he did this. And, you know, I, I know that sometimes I have typos and things on my slides, but I, I want to tell you the typos that are on there right now was exactly the same. You know, with an I instead of a U. But, you know, what I can remember looking at that, and when I looked at it, the only thing that I could see was being proud of the message that that little boy was writing. And, and I sometimes wonder... And hope, is that the way God looks at us? Is, is that what God is looking down on us? Because the question is, according to our sermon this morning, is it direction or perfection? Now we all know that none of us are perfect, right? I, I mean, I, I know that uh, you know, some of us lucky husbands might have some perfect wives. But other than that, we know we're infallible. We, we try with our heart. We try to do what is best to serve God, to follow God. And, and you know, I would say you probably wouldn't expect a kindergarten picture from a senior in high school, though, right? So you think about that from the perspective of Christians and how we should be growing. You know, it's kind of as, as Paul um, scolded the Corinthians, you know, and said, you know, you guys are still drinking milk when you should be eating meat in reference to the fact that they, they had not grown in the Word. There, there's a difference between growing and being stale. There's a difference between growing and still yet not being perfect. So that's what I want to look at here this morning, this idea of what does God expect from us? Now, we all know that without the blood of Christ, we could not even be perfected to make it to heaven in order to be forgiven of our sins. So I want to take a look at a couple of things here in the Scriptures that hopefully will point us in that direction. You know, I, I know I've heard some people, you know, I've even studied with individuals who, you know, you thought that they were ready to be baptized, and you asked them, what is holding you back? I can tell you understand. I can tell you see what you need to do. And I've many times heard the response, well, I'm just not good enough yet. Or I'm just not perfect, even some would say. But usually it's that terminology, I'm just not good enough. And, and sometimes people don't realize that you need to take that step. You believe in God so that He'll continue to encourage you and strengthen you to do better in your life. In, in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 18, it says, And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeting him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who was a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He uh, foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. So here we see an example here. And, and one of the things is later on in this text... His disciples even ask him, why is it that we could not perform this? Why is it that we were not able to do this? And, and really what it comes down to is, you know, the disciples, they failed at healing the young man and the scribes capitalized on it. But if you really stop and you think about it, I can guarantee you Jesus was trying to prove a point here. See, Jesus was the only one that has ever lived on this earth that was perfect. Jesus was the only one that has ever not sinned. Jesus was the only one that could have stood on the cross and died for our sins. Now later on, there is 
um, some Jewish individuals that are trying to cast out a demon. And they're doing everything they can. And they're throwing the book at them, so to speak. And they decide to, you know, use the name of Jesus. And the demon looks at them and says, Jesus I know. And Peter I know, one of the apostles. They were able to do this deed. But it wasn't at this time that they were the ones that were supposed to do this. You know, they had many successes, Mark 6, uh, 7 through 13. But here we see... And, and I, don't, I hate to say failure because it was more of the fact that they probably just weren't ready for that. They, they weren't given that ability yet. Now we take a look at Mark chapter 6, 7 through 13. It says, Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for your uh, journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belt. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if, at, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as your testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. You know, one of the things that sometimes makes it tough for a Christian is oftentimes when we do make a mistake, oftentimes when we do fall short, there's those in the crowd around us that want to point that mistake out. And you know, that's okay. Because sometimes as Christians, we just need to own that we're not perfect. We need to remind people that, you know, hey, I, I, you're right, I made a mistake. You know, I've I've told this story before, but I can remember years ago when I was, um, you know, not preaching full time, but I was working in the world and I was having a bad day. And I I just so happened to be riding along with uh, another person that I worked with in our trucks. And I had something happened and I said something that I just was not becoming of a Christian. And I'll tell you what, and it wasn't this individual's thought wasn't to try to put me down for what I did. It was more of a reminder. And he, and he just, I mean, it almost shocked him. He said, he said to me, he says, what are you doing? You don't talk like that. You know, I almost felt like my dad was in the car scolding me at the time. But you know what? It was something that I needed. It was something that I needed to hear. It's not the same situation here as the scribes just trying to find a uh, uh, something to point and say, see, that, you know, the Messiah is not the Messiah. You know, we also see in John the Baptist, Mark 9, 19 through 27, an imperfect faith. Mark 9, verses 19 through 27, he says, He answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him. Uh, to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and, and swallowed up the foam at his mouth. So he asked his father, How long has it been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, it, If you can believe, all things are possible in him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you come out of him and enter in him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. The father freely admitted to his imperfect faith. I I apologize. I didn't quite get to the John the Baptist part here. I was jumping ahead. Um, But here we see this this idea that the father, you know, had some doubts. This this imperfect faith. And and sometimes, you know, maybe in our, our young Christianity, hopefully as we mature, this doesn't happen, but there may be doubts. There may be times that, 
You know, we have to sit down and pray more. We have to sit down and study more to come to that realization, to not let Satan pull you away. You know, we see in Luke seven eighteen through 23, um, this is the disciples of John, and, and John calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Now when the, the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to say, uh, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour he cursed many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. So here we see in, in Mark 9, 19 through 27, even John the Baptist. Think about this for a minute. You know, this is John who has probably already seen some things, was, was really a prophet from God. And, and he had to ask the question. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong in this world with asking the question, is there a God? As long as we take the time to look around and see that there really is. God does not mind questions. God does not mind us asking things. We hear even John the Baptist had a moment where he says, you know, are you the one or are we supposed to be looking for someone else? You know, he, he wasn't sure at this time. Now we see um, Jesus' response here uh, in Luke seven eighteen through 23. And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. So here we, we see really the example that, that Jesus is showing here. And he uh, continued on, you know, really just to see this example of, of what John the Baptist's disciples had seen. You know, Jesus never really even answered to him and said, yes, I'm the one. Here, there are times that Jesus makes that claim and tells people who he is. But I think here it was more or less, look at all these things that have been done by me and tell John and he'll know what his answer is. You know, it's not necessarily a fatal mistake to not know something if you're actively seeking to know. We need to remember that, that we are disciples, we are learners, and Christian, the Christian life is not an event, but a process of growth. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 2, and verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of em uh, emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in, er in error. Now here we see, that, you know, number one, even as a preacher, I I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I know everything. You know, daily I I'm trying to read my Bible, trying to study, trying to understand more of God's Word. And you know, I can... Remember years ago, asking a gentleman that I had known for a long time, many of you uh, would know who uh, Bill Craddock was, but I remember I was uh, speaking at a men's retreat, and Bill was sitting right there in the front, and I, I asked Bill, I said, Bill, how long have you been preaching? You know, and he said, I, I've been preaching since 1953. Now this was uh, probably right around the turn of this century when I asked that question. And, and I looked at him and I said, Bill, I said, do you still learn from the Bible? And he said, every day. You know, it's an ongoing process. You know, of course we can understand salvation. We can understand the ideas of, of what it is that we need to do in order to improve ourselves and in order to become better Christians. But you know, it's just as the, the Bible study that we've been having on Wednesday night, if you have not been able to partake in that. We, we do that through Zoom as well as on, on Facebook Live. But we've been looking at probably, I'm just going to go out and say it, the greatest sermon that there is in the Bible, and it's the Sermon on the Mount. And I say the greatest because it comes from Jesus. The greatest teacher there ever was. The, the most perfect individual that ever lived. But you know, if you break down the Sermon on the Mount, for all of the things, from the Beatitudes to uh, the other examples, you know, he talks about salt and he talks about light. 
you know, salt losing its flavor and, and light as Christians. You know, we, he, he goes kind of on a, uh, an attack of the, the Pharisees and the scribes, which at, in those days probably surprised a lot of people because they were thought of as being religious. They, that was who you wanted to be. But to really generalize the whole thing, what Jesus is saying is you can do all kinds of good things. You can do, uh, you know, you can be a standout. You can give, you can do this, you can do that. But if you're not really doing it from the heart, it's all useless. And it's similar to what Paul said uh, in, in the book of Corinthians where he talks about the fact that, you know, if you had faith to move a mountain, you can, you know, do all these miracles, you can do all these things. But if you do that without love... It's fruitless. It's worthless. So we need to realize that knowledge is one thing, but the wisdom of knowing how to use that knowledge and the right perspective, now that's what we need. You know, I have numerous times talked to someone who claimed that they did not believe in God, and in a sense, our conversations eventually turned into a debate. And you know what? There have been numerous times that I have heard individuals that claim they don't believe in God, and it was amazing how many scriptures they had memorized. Having it, you know, you could memorize the entire book and know it word for word. You know, a friend of mine told me that when he was in college that um, one of his, his friend's roommates had this ability that he literally, he, he just, he, you know, had one of those photographic memories. He literally knew the Scriptures word for word. Matter of fact, they would play a game and they would test them and they would just throw out an obscure Scripture and verse from, you know, the Old Testament or somewhere in the New Testament and he would quote it. Now, I, I don't know the background of that individual. I don't know what his faith was. But to have all of that knowledge, even to have those Scriptures memorized, it doesn't do anything for us if our heart's not in the game. If we don't have the desire. You know, Christianity is not a checklist. You know, my, my dad, had, had, you know, he would make jokes from time and time again, you know, and he'd say, all right, I checked everything off today. I'm good. I don't have to do anything else. Now, of course, he was being facetious, he would say that in reference to, you know, uh, trying to teach people that that's not what it's about. Matter of fact, we could be obedient to God all we want if it wasn't for God's willingness to give us grace. God's willingness to send His Son to die on the cross and shed His blood. We would have nothing. Not one of us here today is going to be able to stand up at judgment and look at God and say, God, I got myself here. If God looks at us and, and, and we hear that phrase that we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, yeah, it's going to be because we were obedient. But remember, we're not perfect. If God's not willing to forgive, it doesn't matter how much obedience we give from here until the day we die. We're still sinners. But it does come down to that desire and that want to serve God. You know, I, I worry about I worry about people these days. I, I really do, in a sense, feel as if this pandemic that we're going through is just a product of Satan. And I am so afraid that these quarantines, the, the idea that we're staying away from one another, and, and I understand it. I, I'm not against it. I'm not against being safe, wearing masks, you know, social distancing. I, I'm, not, I'm not against that. I'm not even against those that are afraid to come out and, and are using the Internet at this particular time. But I'm afraid that because of the technology we have, that when we get this cleared up, that we're going to replace fellowship with a screen in our home because it's easier. I'll tell you what, not that it's that difficult to put a suit on and tie a tie when I get up on Sunday morning and, and come to church, 
but it sure would be a lot easier to roll out in my pajamas and just go downstairs and sit down in front of the TV. So I pray, every day I pray, that those that are not here with us and that those that are at home because of, of the fear of this and trying to be safe, those that may be um, in a public place constantly and they're afraid that if they get it, they might spread it, that's fine. But I pray that you don't lose your faith over this. That's what scares me. I hope that if you're at home, that you're taking advantage of this. You know, I know a lot more of us have gone back to work now. It's not quite like it was. I mean, it might end up that way like it was in the spring where people were just home. Let's take more time to study our Bibles. Because let's face it, if all we are is a Christian on Sunday, that's not enough either. Let's make sure that our home life is full of the Bible. Let's make sure that we're praying from home, that we're taking time, that we're raising our family to know God. That's what is important. So as I bring this lesson here this evening to its or this morning to its conclusion. See, I felt like I've been preaching for so long, I thought it was nighttime already. But as I bring this lesson here this morning to its conclusion, you know, it brings me back to the title Direction or Perfection. We're never going to meet perfection. But we can get better every day. And I guarantee you, if, we're, if our direction is the right direction, if our heart is there, we're going to want to aim for perfection. It's where we're going to be walking towards. So are we imperfect? We could, you know, if I asked everyone to... One, two, three, let's give the answer on that. It would be probably, hopefully, unisense, right? Yes, of course we are. Why did Jesus have to suffer on the cross? Because we're imperfect. But what is the direction of your life? Even in your imperfection is your direction to pursue God. Or is your imperfection committed as you rebel against God? You know, if you ever wanted to know the answer on how this world could be better, how this country could be better, how our society could be better, how our world could be better, I'm going I'm to give you the perfect formula right now. I don't know how to put it into play because I can't force people to do this. But we all need to turn back to God in every aspect of what we do. If we could do that, this world would be a better place. But you know, unfortunately, we know that this world is going to continue to not get better. That doesn't mean we don't have good times still ahead of us. That doesn't mean that we still can't have positive things. But the only place that's going to be perfect is heaven. And that's where I want to go. And that's where I want you to go. And this morning, if your direction is not pointing towards heaven, I pray that you will do what you need to to correct that. Whether it's the need to confess Jesus and be baptized in His name, repenting of your sins, Maybe you're already a Christian. Maybe your direction at one point was straightforward, you know, straightforward towards heaven. Maybe you veered off a little bit. Maybe there's been some road bumps that has tested your faith. Do what you need to. If you're already a Christian and you have fallen off course, fall down on your knees and point yourself in the right direction. Ask God for help and tell Him you're willing to repent and your direction can change right now.
I pray that we as Christians will not let the negative things of this world pull us away from God. Number one, God does not send negative things our way. Matter of fact, God is, tells us in the Scriptures that even when bad things happen, He can make good out of it. So if you're here this morning and you're not right with Him, I, I pray that you do what you need to. If you're listening to this online and, and you're not right with Him, I, I pray that you'll do what you need to do. Reach out to us. We'll study with you. We'll talk with you. But if you're here this morning and you have any need, if you do need the, the prayers of the church or um, anything other, any other need that you have, we ask that you come forward as we stand and sing this song. Days are filled with sorrow.